So obviously the lipid, you know, like hypothesis or whatever the, you know, idea around what a lot of cardiologists would suggest is, you know, the main risk factor of cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis. Everyone's kind of worried about like, I think the LDL where you can't build plaque is like 70 supposedly or something ridiculously low. And I've heard you say, I think it was on Rogan. You said you've been up to like 500 at one point of LDL. Not now, but in the past. Yeah. So like, obviously people can hear both sides of the coin. They hear people say, like you saying, you shouldn't be worried about it as long as you're metabolically healthy. And then other individuals are like, keep that shit low. Um, It obviously there's some sort of like, I don't know, like, it's hard to just take at face value, like what you say over what, like a bunch of other people say who are credentialed and whatnot, of course. So like people who are trying to hedge against the probability that there might be like some risk, but also like aren't totally in this camp where it's like suppress it to nothingness. And they're somewhere in the middle and they're trying to incorporate, like, I feel like this is going to be the majority of people watching. They're kind of like mindful of it. They're not totally buying into the idea that LDL equals heart disease. But at the same time, they're like cautious enough to not just be like, well, I have a 300 LDL, like I'm fine as long as I'm, you know, exercising and I'm lean. What kind of biomarkers should somebody be looking at on their blood work in order to assess any kind of like the actual markers that you would think are relevant to plaque development? Like, should you be looking at C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, like, um, I don't know, like TMAO, like what would you be looking at as far as risk factors in addition to like, you know, your NMR lipo profile stuff? Yeah, I mean, the NMR lipo profile is actually less less valuable than it's made out to be. Your particle size, maybe, but the, in order, in some semblance of order of importance, I would start with fasting insulin because mm-hmm. then you're going to know if you're metabolically healthy. And you could also triangulate that with a continuous glucose monitor and look at your postprandial levels. It's going to take a little more education to understand how to read a CGM and to know what glycemic variability is good. But some measure of your insulin sensitivity and metabolic health is, is paramount. Fasting insulin. What would you want to see as like a healthy fasting insulin? less than five micro IU per ML. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what yours is? Um, let me pull it up. I have it here. Da, da, da. So that what's interesting about this is that the normal range for fasting insulin goes up to 24 for many, in, for many labs or 16, which is massively disordered. Um, yeah. I can't even imagine waking up with like a 20 and being like, Oh yeah, I'm good. It's healthy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a, antiquated test that we, that is so powerful that we're misusing. Um, but yeah, HSCRP is important. Fibrinogen is important. Some people would say uh, LPPLA2, but LPPLA2 is really a metric. It's going to track with LDL and ApoB. Um, and then there's another metric you can get from a lab called Boston Heart called oxidized phospholipids on ApoB, which will give you a much better sense of oxidized LDL than a, than a traditional oxidized LDL test. Traditional oxidized LDL tests are really inaccurate. Again, they're just a they're just a proxy for ApoB and um, the LDL number. And so, while you're looking for that, I'll just I'll expound a little bit on the LDL stuff for people. This is a whole podcast in itself, and I've gone down this rabbit hole many times in my podcast. Um, basically, the LDL molecule it's a lipoprotein. It's essential for human life. So it doesn't make sense to me at a high level intuitively why it would also be killing us. Um, it could be a concentration effect, but then you're looking at like kinetics and Brownian motion, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either, because if you do the numbers, LDL is massive, no matter whether you're 70 milligrams per deciliter or 250 milligrams per deciliter, we're talking 10 to the 15th LDL particles either way. And, you know, maybe, you know, hundred versus 200 is 10 to the 15th or 10 to the 16th, but 10 to the 15th LDL particles is like as many cells in your body. So it doesn't like just... The argument to me that like, if you get down to seven times 10 to the 15th particles of LDL, you're not going to get atherosclerosis. But if you have, uh, you know, 10 times 10 to the 15th particles of LDL, you are, it's like, man, that's, that's a lot of LDL, no matter how you do it. And we know that the spaces between the endothelial cells are big enough to allow the LDL in and out. There's something else going on there. I think there's something else changing the context. And that to me is metabolic health. And there's Tons of good evidence here to support this assertion that ApoB is not the ultimate arbiter, that is essentially LDL, of, of atherosclerosis. It can correlate, but is it the fireman or is it, a, is it the arsonist? I don't think LDL particles 
are directly atherogenic to the human endothelium. That doesn't make sense to me, and I don't think there's enough data to support that. Now, again, deep rabbit hole. I'll just I'll hit a couple of highlights here. There's definitely case studies of people with familial hypercholesterolemia, LDLs four to 600 for their whole life with zero atherosclerosis. So if LDL is causing atherosclerosis, why is this guy an outlier? And there's multiple cases of that. If LDL is directly causing injurious injury to the endothelium, why do you only accumulate atherosclerosis in the arteries and not the veins? They all have endothelium. The concentration of LDL is the same in all of them. There's something else going on. And many people would say, oh yeah, well, the endothelium has to be injured. Okay, well then if the endothelium has to be injured, LDL isn't really injuring the endothelium because there's the same amount of LDL in a vein as there is in an artery. Then you have all kinds of interesting medical anomalies. There's a condition called uh, glycogen storage disease 1A. I think it's von Gerke's disease where people have elevated levels of LDL, but they don't have elevated levels of atherosclerosis. Okay, so what's going on there? There's many examples of this. There's on the flip side, there's familial Dunnigan hyperlipidystrophy where people have normal levels of LDL, but they have accelerated atherosclerosis. And in the case of familial Dunnigan hyperlipidystrophy, hyperlipidystrophy, like that one is fascinating because there's a mutation that causes them to be insulin resistant. So they distribute their fat. So lipodystrophy is something where people have increased visceral adipose tissue, but very lean extremities. They don't have visceral fat. They don't, excuse me, they don't have subcutaneous fat. That's all visceral fat. They have like a total. Yeah, I, saw, I did a video on a guy who was like 2% body fat and ate like 10,000 calories a day or something. And he had like an insanely fatty liver and like issues, but he looked like super lean. Except it's, yeah, except the visceral adipose tissue. So this done again lipodystrophy, they have insulin resistance, but not elevated LDL. Guess what? They get massive atherosclerosis. It's very aggressive. So that's just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Then you can look at cohorts of people, Framingham and Haynes. And if you stratify those cohorts by some metric that gives you a sense of insulin sensitivity, whether that's HDL, fasting insulin, triglycerides, whatever, all of those might give you a sense of insulin sensitivity, aka metabolic dysfunction. You see the risk of LDL and heart disease essentially vanish or is massively attenuated. So for instance, in the Framingham cohort, if you have a low HDL, which is a proxy for insulin resistance, then LDL tracks very well with cardiovascular disease. But if you have an HDL of 65 or 85, most of those people are pretty freaking insulin sensitive milligrams per deciliter. There's essentially no relationship or a massively attenuated relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease. So there's something else going on here. That's a very high level brush with all of that. But I think there's enough evidence to say, I don't think we can prove that ApoB containing particles, which is mostly LDL, but also includes things like chylomicrons, et cetera, are directly injurious to the endothelium. And I think that details matter here because if you're saying LDL, causes atherosclerosis, you have to prove to me that LDL injures the endothelium and is enough on its own to cause it. And I don't think that's true. I think there's something else going on.